Hi, I'm Jamie Stegmeyer, the designer of Scythe, um, which I'm publishing through my company, Stonemeyer Games. I'm here today to do a, uh, a run-through of the gameplay of Scythe. I'm going to play a few turns um, in a two-player game and then show you some of the things that happen in the later stages of the game. Scythe is a two-to-five-player game, um, and we found in playtesting, we took an average of all the playtests that we've done, all the blind playtests. We've had over 750 blind playtest sessions, and the average playtime was about 115 minutes um, from all player counts. So that's the, the, the number we're putting on the box, 115 minutes. Sometimes games can go much shorter than that. Sometimes they can go a little longer, especially when you're learning the game. All right, let's begin. So I have set up the prototype of the game. These are not final components for a two-player game with uh, Saxony against... Crimea. I chose these two factions just because they're on the, the bottom of the board. Each faction, part of the asymmetry of the game is that each faction has, a, has the same starting area every game. Um, and that, that gives you some different starting resources. But also at the beginning of the game, each player not only has a player mat that matches with their faction, but they also have a randomly selected player mat that matches with that faction mat. Um, so, so I've already done the setup here, I've already done the randomization. And these player mats, uh, the player mat and the faction mat, tell you your starting resources. So the, the Saxon faction, they're really strategic. So they start out with four combat cards and a low power, power is shown on this track. Um, whereas Zara, which is the character in the uh, Crimean faction, she starts off very powerful, a lot of combat power, but with no strategy, no, no uh, combat cards in hand. Also, the player mats show us a few other starting resources. Every player starts with two objective cards, um, and you can see the, uh, the Crimean faction here in this game, starting with two popularity, opposed to three popularity over here for the Saxons, and four money, uh, with six coins over here with the Saxon player. The object of the game is to end the game with the most coins. So coins are important. Coins are the same as victory points in this game. So I'm going to uh, walk through a few turns. Before I do that, I just want to explain one concept, one key concept of the game, um, which is that all the action happens on the mat, or on the board, I'm sorry. So everything that you see here is happening on the board. Uh, you'll you'll gather resources on the board, you'll, you'll move your character on the board, you'll build your empire on this board. Uh, the idea is that in Scythe, uh, there was a, a great war in Eastern Europe, in an alternate history Eastern Europe, and at the end of that war, um, which was fueled mostly by this factory in the middle of the board, this is a, a made-up factory, kind of a city-state capitalistic uh, empire, uh, that that fueled this great war and when the factory shut down or when the war ended the factory shut down and all of the surrounding factions the Saxons the Polania faction uh, there's some expansion factions that aren't actually in the game yet but we we put them on the board so the Nordic uh, the Rusviat faction Crimea all these factions converge upon this patch of land as they seek to to conquer it and to take it over um, and to build their empire there. Um, all right, so let's start taking some turns. So a turn in Scythe, uh, we will start with the player, the starting player is the one with the, the lowest number here, so we'll start with the Crimean faction. Um, on your turn, you have this player mat, and all you're doing on your turn is choosing to take either, you're choosing one of the four sections on the player mat, you can see them divided by these vertical lines, and you're choosing to take either the top action, or the bottom action, or both actions on that section, starting with the top action. Um, so a big part of the game is trying to optimize your engine so that on your turn you're not just taking one action, you're taking both of those actions. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to take uh, different actions for both of these, these factions so you can get an idea of what each action looks like. Um, 
And something you might notice by looking at these two player mats is that the bottom row actions are in the same order, uh, whereas the, the top row actions are in a different order. So every game is a little different in terms of how, how you're um, kind of comboing those top and bottom actions. All right, uh, so we're, we're, we have the Crimean faction here. I'll just start on the far left just because it's, it's easier. Um, so the Crimean faction, I'm going to place my little uh, player token there. And you do that because I can't take that same, I can't choose that same section on subsequent turns. I have to choose a different section on my next turn. But it's the first turn, so I get the choice of all four of them. So I'm going to choose this. It, this is the bolster action. And basically the way you take an action is you pay the cost. So I see the cost of one coin, so I'm going to pay, I'm using Tuscany coins here, so I'll pay a coin. Um, and then I have a choice. I can, I'm bolstering, so I can either gain two power or I can gain a combat card. Um, so I'm going to, because the, uh, this faction started with zero combat cards, I'm going to take a combat card. So the combat cards are in a big pile up here at the top of the board, so I'm going to take one of those. I'll show it to you. So these, these combat cards are numbered uh, two to five. You can see the distribution up here at the top of the board uh, for each of the numbers. So I got the lowest one. I got, I got a two. So this goes to my hand. Now this is kind of actually neat for the Crimean faction um, because each faction has a different ability that's unique to that faction. And with the Crimean faction, their ability is that once per turn, I can spend a combat card as if it's a resource. So the Crimeans are all about trading information and using information as a resource. So on a future turn, if I need a resource and I don't have that resource, I could use this card instead. All right, and that's it. Uh, I could take this bottom action, but this bottom action costs, uh, let's see if you can adjust the camera here. Uh, this bottom action costs four oil, which I don't have, so I can't take the bottom action. So that's it for your turn. Turns are, are really quick inside. All right, so let's switch over to the Saxon player. So the Saxon player, um, they're gonna, they, so they have a different action over here in the top left compared to the top left of the, the Crimean player mat, or the current Crimean player mat. So I will choose this action. This is the trade action. So again, I'm paying a coin. So I'll pay a coin. And then I have a choice. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but basically I can choose either any two resources um, or I can uh, get a popularity. I'll explain popularity a little bit later, so let's, we'll focus on the resources for now. So, and it says trade with a worker, so it means that I'm going to uh, put those resources on one of my workers on the board. You start the game with your character on your home base, and then uh, one worker on each of the two adjacent uh, territories that are adjacent to your home base. So I have two workers out there. Um, the trade action lets me trade for any resource, regardless of what I have going on on the board. So I'm going to look at uh, the Saxon player's uh, starting area. They have a, a mountain here, which makes metal. They have a village that makes people, which is not a resource, but it, that's what's produced there. And there is a, a tundra there that produces oil. So I don't make food and wood. So... Um, I'm going to I'm going to trade for wood. I paid the coin, and I'm going to trade for wood. They could be they could be uh, two of the same resources or two different resources, but I'm just choosing two wood here. So those two wood will go on that worker. Um, and so this is what I was alluding to earlier, um, where I said that all the resources that you have in this game actually go on the map, on the board. They're not kept off the board. Um, so in this case, uh, I, I control this territory because I have a unit there. I have at least one of my, my tokens on that territory. So it means on a later turn, if I need to spend that wood, as long as I still control that territory with the wood on it, I can spend that wood. Your units can move around uh, resources too. I'll, I'll show that on a future turn. So let's go back down to the Saxon player mat here. So it says that... Uh, if I, also, if I had four oil to spend, I could do an upgrade, but I don't have four oil, so I can't do that action. So let's go back over to the Crimean player, um, and let's 
choose their second action over here, which is the produce action. So again, you uh, just like any action, you pay the cost, and right now the costs are covered up with workers, so you're not actually seeing any red boxes, like we saw that red coin before. There's no, there's no cost this time, because all those boxes are covered up. And it says, produce with workers on two territories. Those are two little hexes there. So if we look at the board over here, you can see that the Crimean player has uh, two territories under their control right now. So those are the two territories I'm going to choose to produce on. If I had, say I had already had a worker out here, I would have to choose two of these territories to produce on. But all workers on those territories produce. So if I had, say, uh, say I had two workers there, I could choose that territory to produce and this territory to produce, and each of the workers on those territories would produce one of the resources associated with that territory. So let's go ahead and take that produce action. So over here, um, this guy produces a food. I'm using uh, our, our realistic resource tokens for, for food here, and these will be included in the collector's edition of Scythe. Um, on Kickstarter. And this guy, this guy's on a village, so he gets pr to produce another worker. Um, and then again, we can look at the bottom row action here, which is uh, we can deploy a mech, but it costs metal, and we don't have metal yet, so we can't take that action. So that's it for, for that player's turn. All right, so let's go back over here to Saxony. What action haven't we taken yet? So we've done a, we've done, uh, we can't choose this action again. Actually, okay, so the last one that we haven't chosen yet is the move action. You'll be moving a lot inside, so this is a good one to show. So the move action, um, there's kind of a choice here. There's no payment to move. Uh, you can just get a coin instead of moving, um, which is something that you very rarely do in the game. You would very rarely take that action, but it's kind of a backup if you run out of coins to take other actions. Um, so we're going to take a pretty standard action here. We're going to take a movement. Um, so what this is saying is that you can move two different units. And so what I'm going to do here, one of my units is my character, and I want to move my character off my home base onto the board. So I'm going to move one space. And that's it for that, that unit's movement. And then... Um, I actually, I'm pretty happy where my workers are right now, so I'm not going to move another one. You don't have to take, you can take as much of a benefit of, as an, of an action as you want. So that's the only movement I'm going to take right now. Now say I did want to move this worker. Um, I can't move onto or across water. Uh, so for example, like every home area has uh, a river surrounding it. Let's see. Going off the board here. So there's a river surrounding, and there's a lake right here, surrounding the three starting territories. So at the beginning of the game, you're kind of landlocked, uh, which is a, actually a good thing. You're landlocked because it gives you a chance to build up your empire and your infrastructure a little bit. Um, and it's pretty hard for other players to get into that area. So even after you've started exploring the board, uh, your home area is pretty safe from other players. It's not... Uh, it's not totally safe, but it's pretty safe. So it kind of serves as a, a private area for you to, to build up on. All right, so again, we can look to see if I can afford the bottom row action. This is for wood to build. I can't afford that yet, so I can't take that action. All right, so let's go back over here to Crimea. Crimea just produced, and I want to get some resources out here so we can actually show you some bottom row actions. Um, so... Actually, I'll just I'll accelerate the game a little bit so you can see the bottom row actions. So let's say that, um, let's say that this the Crimean player at some point maybe they they traded for some oil, uh, so they have they have some oil out there now. So say the Crimean player goes back and takes the bolster action again. Um, actually, they only need two of those. This is, this is a good example. So say the Crimean player has. Uh, they have two oil out there on the board, and they take this action. So they would first take the top action. They would pay a coin, and they would say they're going to get another combat card. So this time they get another two. We get another two there. And then 
they look at the bottom row action here. And the bottom row action is upgrade. So each of these red boxes shows one oil token. So you have to pay three oil and you get an upgrade. And you also get three coins. You can see on the bottom row actions, uh, there are different coin benefits for each of these bottom row actions. Some of them have none. Some of them, there's one, two, and three. Uh, this player map's a little different. They have two, two, two. So the Crimean player is going to upgrade here. So the first thing they're going to do is they're going to pay three oil. As I mentioned before, though, the Crimean player, they only have two oil, but they have a special ability that says once per turn they can use a combat card in the place of a resource. So they're going to do that. They're going to spend two oil and one combat card, which is the cost of the upgrade right now for them. So let's spend that. And um, the first thing they do is just get the coins, because it's, sometimes it's kind of easy to forget to take those coins. So they're going to take three coins. And then they're going to take an upgrade. And I'm going to mention something here. It's just me playing the game, so I can't actually show this all that effectively. But inside, as soon as you've reached this point on a bottom row action where you have a, a choice to make, like I have to decide which upgrade I'm going to do, the next player can start their turn. Um, you go clockwise around the table. So that kind of keeps the game moving along uh, so that everyone's not stuck waiting for me to make this important decision. The next player can start their turn. I can't show that now because it's just me, but um, I'll show you what an upgrade is. So you can see on the Crimean player's player mat that they have these little cubes. These are technology cubes. And on an upgrade action, what you get to do is pick up one of these cubes. So let's say they'll pick up this cube. You can pick up a cube from anywhere on any of the green boxes on your mat. And then you get to put it down on any of the red boxes that have the little brackets around it. So you can see that some of these are bracketed and some of them have solid borders. The solid borders you can't ever put cubes on. But uh, the, any, any of the other ones are eligible to put cubes down. So I am going to make... Um, I'm going to put the cube down here. So I picked it up from over here. Um, which makes this action better. I've, whenever, from now on, I want to trade to gain popularity, I'm going to gain two popularity instead of one. And I've also made this action cost less. So now instead of paying three metal to deploy a mech, I only have to pay two metal. And that is it for the upgrade action. So let's go over here to the Saxons. Um, let's say at this point, Let's say the Saxons on, on a turn, maybe they, they upgraded uh, the build action. So, so I can show that action. Actually, no, they, they took that last turn. Okay, let's, let's jump ahead. So they took a different turn, and they're back, uh, and they want to take, uh, take this action. So I'm going to show you two things on this turn. Uh, one's going to be a build, and one's going to be related to the movement. Um, so I'm going to show you, show you a couple things. So let's... Uh, First show you, so I get to move two different units, right? Um, the first unit will be this worker. Uh, I didn't move him before, but just to show you, I'm going to move the worker over here. And you can see that the worker carried with him all those wood resources, which is important. Your units can carry any number. I'm going off the board here again, aren't I? All right. Uh, so this, this worker just carried those two wood resources. Any units can carry any, any number of resources so that you can still spend them. Um, and I'm also going to move my character. I'm going to move the character here. And you can see on the board, there's a little glass token here. I don't, it won't be, it'll be cardboard in the final game. Um, and there are 11 of these out on the board at the beginning of the game. They're all on this little symbol, which is the encounter icon. One of the unique things about your character um, is that your character can have encounters. They're encountering local people as they're walking through this land and, and situations that they have to encounter. So when, you, when your character ends up on an encounter, you pick up the token and you take it off the board and you draw an encounter card. So we've drawn this encounter. He's encountered, uh, let's see if we can focus on it. All right, so your, uh, so Gunther, the Saxon player, 
has encountered this, this card, and what he'll do is he'll show the art to all the other players, and then he'll read the all caps text out loud to show them uh, the choices that he has. So in this case, there's always a choice that gains you a little, little popularity and a little something else. Um, so he could pet the reindeer and flirt with the locals to, to gain some popularity and some money. He could stock up on oil for the journey ahead. There's always an option that uh, lets you pay money to gain something. And there's always kind of a mean option. You can convince the soldier that reindeer aren't real. And if you do that, you're paying popularity. You're becoming less popular, less popular with the locals, but you get a pretty strong benefit usually. Um, so in this case, uh, let's say I, I will, I'll choose the last option. Um, just so I can show you how that, that choice works. So, in, so he's going to convince the soldier that reindeer aren't real. So what that, so it's a two, pay two popularity to enlist one recruit. I'll show you what that means. So we'll discard the card and we're going to look over here at the popularity chart. So you can see right now I'm at three popularity, so I have to pay two popularity. And then I get to enlist a recruit. So recruits are all down here at the bottom of the board. These are people that can join your troop, um, but they don't join you on the board itself. They're actually just, uh, they're kind of showing up with some stuff to give you, and then from then on they're, they're going to help your troop uh, whenever you do certain things or whenever other players do certain things. So basically you get to enlist a recruit. So I'm going to pick up, say I'll pick up uh, this one since I know I'm going to take this action in a minute. Uh, so I'm going to pick up this recruit and I get to put it down on any of these four spots for an immediate bonus. So uh, the Saxon player, uh, I'll have him take some money so he'll gain two coins. So that's your immediate bonus. Every recruit also has an ongoing bonus that you get right here. So from now on, whenever I take this bottom row action, this uh, build the structure action, or whenever, see this little symbol, whenever I take it or whenever the player to my left or my right takes that action, I gain that bonus. So from now on in a two player game, there's only one other player here. So whenever this player uh, takes this, this action, uh, this build action, I gain a popularity. Now I chose that enlistment because we're still on my turn here. I've done the movement, uh, we did the encounter card, but now I get to take the bottom row action. And you might remember, remember on a previous turn, I took two wood. Um, I, I traded for two wood, so I have two wood now that I can spend if I want. You can see them up here. So I'm going to spend this two wood. Spend that two wood and I get to build a structure. Um, again, I'm gonna take the coins first so I don't forget to take them later. And this is when the, the other, the Crimean player could start to take their turn if they wanted to. And I'm going to put out a structure. I'm showing you pretty much everything on this turn because everything kind of lined up here. So I'm build, building a structure. Um, you have four structures on your player mat, the armory, the monument, the mine, and the mill. All player mats have those four structures. Um, normally they'd be black. I just don't have black tokens for those two. And I am, I get to put them, I get to have one of my workers build them on the map. So, uh, let's see, I will, I'll have, uh, I'll have them build a mine. Mines are pretty good. So I'm going to have these guys build this mine. And basically what a mine does, is it, it lets you move through the mine to any of these tunnels on the board. So you can see these six tunnels, they're all connected. So if I had, say my character is out here, I can move from this tunnel to any other tunnel. Uh, this makes the map smaller than it appears to be because you can easily jump across the board. Um, but you can also move through your mine. You can move through your, your mine to a tunnel or you can move from a tunnel back to your mine. Other players can't move, use your mine, only you can use it. Um, so I built that, and uh, I think that's the end of that turn. All right, so let's say I, I have some concepts to show you. So I've shown you how to take a turn, basically, and show you how to take the top row actions and the bottom row actions. Oh, we, I actually forgot one. We need to deploy a mech. So I need to show you how to deploy a mech. 
So we're down here. So say we had these two uh, workers up there on the map. Now they're on an encounter token, but only your character has encounters. So uh, those, when those workers move there, they're not going to have an encounter there. So I'm going to take this action. I'm going to take another produce action. So I get to pay the cost. There's, current, there's still no cost there. Um, as you move workers off, there will be costs. And uh, by the end of the game, you might have all of your workers off there. And so every time you produce, you're paying this entire cost. You're paying a power, popularity, and a money just to produce a coin. Um, so I'm going to take that produce action. I get to choose two territories I control with workers, and all those workers are going to produce. So let's have this guy produce a food, and we'll have these guys produce. Each of, each of those workers produces a metal. And that works out well because earlier I upgraded this action so that a mech only cost two metal to deploy. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I have the two metal to spend now. I, I control this metal, so I get to spend it. I'll gain two coins, and actually while I'm doing coins, I can show you, I do have some of the sample coins from size. Uh, they're, they're not quite final yet, but I can show you, let's see if we can focus on this. So I have the 10 lira coin, or 10 unit coin, I have the 20, I have the 3, the color of this one will be a little different, the color of this one will be a little different too, but this is the, the 1 coin. Um, and there's also, there's also a five that's really not the right color at all at this point, but uh, you can kind of see what it looks like. So those are the, the actual metal coins. They'll be in the, the premium version of Scythe. All right, so we're back to the map here. So we are deploying a mech. So you can see that every uh, faction starts with four mechs on their faction mat, and each mech is covering up a different ability. Um, all these abilities are different for every faction. Every faction has a version of the river walk, and every faction does have speed, but these two in particular are, are very unique for each faction. Um, so let, I'll do the river walk because it's a pretty commonly used one, or all these really end up used. So I'll, I'll deploy a mech, so I get to choose one of these mechs, and the workers are the one building the mech, so I can choose one of these sets of workers and just put the mech down there. Again, only the characters have an encounters, so even though the mech is there, the mech doesn't have an encounter. Um, and from now on, we have this new ability here, Riverwalk. So this says that my, my character and my mech, all, all mechs, all of these mechs, have the ability to move across rivers to farms or tundra. So let's go over here and look at the Crimean section. So from now on, my mechs and my character can move across rivers into farms or tundras. So there's a tundra right here. So on a future turn, if I wanted to move, this mech isn't now just restricted to this area, but he can move across the river into this tundra. And this is one of the ways that uh, home bases, your, your home territories, can become vulnerable to other players. Um, because every faction has a different river walk ability that lets them move across into different types of terrain. Um, early in the design of the game, it was just open, completely open. You could just move across rivers, period. But we found that players would almost immediately move into someone else's home base, and it was a little bit too invasive. Um, so we've changed that a bit. So every, every player will get this little guide. This is obviously a prototype guide that shows um, which other... Fa Let's see if I can get a focus here. Uh, it shows which factions can use their river walk to move into your area. So you can see that, um, like, we have the Saxon player. The Saxon player can look over here and see that they're not threatened by the Crimean faction. There's no Crimean icon here. The Crimeans can't get into their area. So you can look at this thing really quick just to see whenever uh, another faction deploys their river walk mech bonus, you can see if you're, you're suddenly being threatened by them or not. Um, all right, so we've shown you how to deploy a mech. All right, so we have a few other things to show you. Um, all right, let's, let's show you what happens when you get to the factory. So the factory is in the middle of the board. You can see it right here. And so 
your character has one other unique ability. Actually, now let me back up a little bit here because this mech moved across the river. The mech, the mech special ability is that they can not only move resources, but they can also move workers. So they can load up as many workers or resources as they want and they move them with him. So that, that mech has just moved all that stuff across the river with him. Again, this is a prototype board. The, uh, the hexes on the final board are, are a lot bigger so that there's more room on the board. Okay, so we've, we've shown you how, uh, the, what the, the mech can do. Your character, in addition to having encounters, can also has a special ability when they arrive at the factory. So when the, your character ends their turn on the factory, which is kind of the focal point of the board, so the middle of the board, when they end their turn on the factory, they get to... Let's see. Can hear? So at the beginning of the game, I set this up. There are three factory cards in this pile over here. It's the number of players plus one. When your character ends their turn on the factory, they get to look through these cards, and they get to pick one, and they put the rest back. And what these are, you can recognize them, they look pretty similar to your player mat because they actually become, um, these are an extension to your player mat. You're adding a fifth section to your player mat. Um, all these have a different powerful ability that you can use. And they have a special movement bonus at the bottom that lets you move the same unit twice, which is unique because usually when you move inside, you, uh, you only get to move each unit once. So I'm going to take these, let's see, so I get to choose one of these and put it down here. I'll just choose, uh, I'll choose this one. So this lets me, so this is a pretty powerful bonus here. Right? Let me go back up here and show it. This thing says that I can spend a popularity to gain a recruit or, a, or an upgrade. So I don't need any resources for those things um, when I use this card. I can just I can just take this action and spend a popularity to automatically just gain an upgrade or a recruit. And then I get to move again. So th these bonuses are very powerful. Um, I'll put the rest of the cards back up here on the board because the other player gets to explore the factory as well. You can only have one factory card total. So that's the factory. Let me show you uh, one other thing. A few other kind of closing. I'm, I'm going to stop taking turns at this point, but I'll show you a few things. Every player I mentioned early on has a few objective cards. Um, so you can accomplish one of these during the game unless you are the Saxon player, which I actually am, which allows you to accomplish um, from, you can, you can accomplish both of these if you want, if you're the, the Saxon player. So these are kind of just little goals. So this one says, you're the beloved pacifist. If you have zero power, at least 13 popularity, and at least five workers, you accomplish this goal. And over here, Northern Advantage, control at least three tundra territories at the end of your turn. So why are these goals important? As we move through the game, we're moving towards the conclusion of the game. There are no rounds or phases inside. You're just taking turns one after another um, until a player has placed all six of their stars, you start out with six stars, up here in the upper left hand corner of the board. So these are various goals that you're trying to accomplish during the game. Um, and they're basically saying that you've completed certain aspects of your infrastructure. So this one says when you have all six of your upgrades, you put a star there. This one says when you all have all four mechs, all four structures, all four uh, recruits, all eight of your workers. So those are things that you can complete. And when you do, you, you get to put a star out there. So you can, you can put one of your stars on it. You can do, focus solely on infrastructure if you want. Um, this one says complete one objective. So that's why I showed you that you have two objectives. You can only actually complete one of them unless you're the Saxon faction, because their special ability says that you can complete as many as you want, so they can complete both. Uh, so if you complete an objective, you get to put a star there. There are two combat stars. So this is a key element of Scythe. You can't just solely focus on fighting your opponents, um, because the, really the only benefit is that you can get up to two stars there. Uh, earlier in the design, we had that be unlimited. You get as many stars as you want, and we found that players would just... Uh, often attack a lot and, and not 
give other players the time to build up their infrastructure, which wasn't as fun. So we have a little visit here from Biddy. Um, so you could get two stars from combat. You can get a star if you have 18 popularity. And you can get a star if you have 16 power. So if you've maxed out your power or popularity, um, then you get, you get a star from that. Uh, I'm going to show you combat. And then I think I'll show you end game scoring. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. So let's do let's do a combat. Now combat inside is a little misleading because we have all these giant mechs stomping around. But you'll notice in Jacob's art. Uh, let's see if we can find some mechs. So there are lots of mechs in his art, but the mechs aren't aren't necessarily fighting. They're just they're part of everyday life. They're just here. So in Scythe, it's not really a combat-driven game. It's more that the threat of combat is always there. Um, and so you're kind of building up your power so that other players won't attack you. Um, and then at key moments, you will attack other players if you need to take over their territory. So let's have a combat here between, in the middle of the board, um, unless Biddy, okay, yep. Yeah. Uh, so let's put, uh, so let's, Zara got to the factory, she's there. Let's say Gunter shows up. So he uses a movement, say, to move one unit and then another movement. So, so that's part of, that's how you can move multiple units into the same territory as, uh, as, uh, as someone else's, uh, unit. And after you've completed your movement, combat happens. So... In combat, each player. All right, maybe we'll have to get you off the board here. All right, in combat, each player gets a combat dial, or we call it a power dial, and you can see it goes up to seven here. So even if you have, here, I'll get this visible on the board. So we have this. We have the power track down here. Uh, obviously, the uh, the Saxon player is not focused on getting much power. The red, the seven is circled because seven is the maximum amount of power that you could spend in combat. But you also get to add in combat cards um, in secret. So, so, uh, and this happens simultaneously. So, the Saxon player is moved into onto the factory where the uh, the Crimean player is, and so combat happens. So each player gets one of these dials and puts uh, combat cards if they want equal to the number of combat units. So the miniatures, the miniatures are the combat units, the workers don't fight. Um, they get to put that many cards behind their power dial if they want. So let's look at the state here. The Saxon player has uh, two units, so they can put up to two combat cards. They also only have one power. So let's say they spend that power. They're going to, this is, so they're actually going to spend that one. And then let's look to see what combat cards they have. All right, so they have they have some decent cards here, mostly twos, but they do have a four in here. So the Crimean player doesn't know what they have. So there's there's some sneakiness happening here. So the Saxon player is going to slip these behind the dial, and they're going to put their little thing down. This is happening simultaneously as the Crimean player is also choosing. So the Crimean player they also have a combat card, but. Um, and let's say they use it. I mean, why they in general you would spend your uh, you would spend something in combat. It's very rare that you would just spend nothing in combat because at the end of combat, uh, if you lose, um, well, I'll, I'll show you that in a second. So, so let's say the the Crimean player they have five power to spend, so they're going to choose five and they're going to slip their little card back, back here. And in this case, we're going to say the Saxon player was the attacker. Attackers win ties. So both of these players reveal their combat dials. So over here with Crimea, we have a total power of seven. And over here with uh, Saxony, they have a total power of seven as well. And so they tied. So in this battle where it kind of looked like Crimea had the edge, the Saxon brought in more units and they were able to win the combat. So um, a few things happen because they won. The first thing that happens is that uh, 
They, they spend the power, so both of these players spend all of their power in this combat. They spend all their power. Um, all of the combat cards get discarded over here. So they're discarded. And then the Saxon player, uh, since they won combat, they get to put one of their stars up here. They get a, a combat victory star. And remember, the game will end when you have all six stars out there. Um, and uh, the Crimean player, they lost, so they have, to, they have to retreat all their units back to their home base. So they have to go all the way back there, but at least they put up a fight, and they put up a pretty good fight. If you put up any bit of a fight, then as you retreat, you get to draw a combat card. So the Crimean player, uh, because they put up a fight, they get to draw a combat card that they can have for a future combat. Um, one other thing to observe here, say the Crimean player had a worker there. Let's say they had, yeah, let's say they had one worker there. Whenever you f aggressively force another player's worker off their land, they're not happy about it. So say the Saxon player won combat, all these units have to move back to the Crimean player's home base, and there was a worker in there. So for every worker you force off their land, you lose a popularity. So the second player goes down to zero popularity as a result. Um, and so this is a way that you can, you can kind of, I, I don't want to quite call it a human shield, but you can s put workers out on the, in the middle of the board, the public areas of the board, and there's a, a reason for other players not to just go in there and take over those territories. Because say, say you have a couple workers here, um, they're not even protected by anyone, so no combat would even happen. If, but if this Saxon player moved into that territory and forced them off their land, they would, they would retreat. Um, that Saxon player would lose two popularity. And popularity is quite important at the end of the game. And so that's, that's a kind of a way that you can discourage other players from attacking you without actually being uh, very militaristic yourself. So let's talk about the end of the game and why popularity matters. So at the end of the game, say, uh, you know, say we have six stars out here. Uh, say this player, and say the Crimean player has, they got some stars out there too. They say that they have uh, good power, they, have, they got an objective card, they did some things the same as, so you can do the same things as the other player. I don't want to put them there, so I'll, I'll put them over there. So say we got all those, those stars out there. The Saxon player plays the sixth star and end of the game. Now we turn to endgame scoring. So in the end of the game, all that matters are coins for endgame scoring. So during the game, the Saxon player accumulated some coins, which is good. But you also get some coins at the end of the game based on your popularity level. So say we ended the game, the Saxon player did some pretty unpopular things this game. Uh, the Crimean player focused a lot more on popularity and was popular. And if you're popular, then the people of the land, which is where the popularity comes from, they're going to reward you more than if you're less popular. So at the end of the game, we're going to score for three categories and this little bonus. So we're going to score for the number of stars you have, and you'll score coins equal to your popularity level. So first we'll look at stars. The Crimean player has four stars up there, and for each one of those stars, they get four coins. So they would get a total of 16 coins for their four stars. Now the Saxon player, they have more stars out there. They have a total of six stars, but they only score three, points for, uh, three coins for each of them. So they get a total of 18 coins. Uh, so it's 18 versus 16. And so you score for every uh, territory you control at the end of the game. A uh, Saxon player right now controls six territories, so they would get two coins for each of those territories. And then the Crimean player over here only controls two territories because your home base is not a territory. So they would score three coins for each of those territories. Last, you also score for every two resources you control. So the Saxon player right now has two wood, so they would score one coin for those two resources. Um, also, at the beginning of the game, there is a randomized structure bonus tile put out. There are six of these. There's one per game. Um, and what this is saying is that for every uh, lake you have next to a structure, you get uh, coins, depending on the total. 
So I put out some, some uh, structures here for the Saxon faction to show you. Uh, so there's, they have a structure here, here, and here. That's one lake, two, three, four, and five. So since they have a total of five lakes that are next to their structures, they get six points. Note that even though um, these two structures are next to the same lake, that's still just one lake. So you get five, six extra coins. All right, final thoughts time for Scythe. Uh, thank you for bearing with me through this run through. This is the first time I've done one of these. Um, I understand that there are a lot of rules in Scythe, but I've tried to design it so that most of those rules make sense. Um, and the game is kind of broken up into little bite sized pieces through like the actions on your player mat. Uh, you start off with very little and you expand to have a lot of options, things like that. But also, I found that uh, while teaching the game at Gen Con, that there's a way to teach Scythe where you don't explain the vast majority of the rules. You just explain a few of the core concepts to a new player. And then you give them this little guide that we're including with the game. We're including five of these, one for each player, um, that tells you those core concepts. And it gives you something to do on each of your first five turns to kind of get you into the, into the game, to understand the game. Things like, on the first turn, take one of the top row actions that no one else has taken before. So you can observe other players as they take top row actions, and then you'll take a new one to discover how it works. And you might have to refer to the rules to figure out how that works, but if you have experienced players at the table, they can tell you how it works. What this does, I found, is that if you have a group of like five people, where half of them, maybe three of them, have played side before, and you have two new players, um, and you don't want to spend 30 minutes explaining the rules to those two new players, especially when three people already know how to play, all you have to do is give them this little card. And by giving them this card, they can actually just start playing. Um, this kind of helps, uh, it helps both the new players get into the game within just a few minutes, and it helps those that's more experienced players invite new players into the game without having to sit through 30 minutes of rules explanation. So that is uh, that side. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Thanks.